wanted to begin this morning by bringing greetings back from Houston, Texas. Um, some of you will remember Tunde and Grace Emmanuel. Um, they spent four years here with us as he completed his Ph.D. at Mines. And um, God bless them with three precious little girls, uh, Tolu, Tomi, and Toby. And uh, we had a, a, an, an incredible time with all of them this last week, uh, Thursday through Saturday. Um, but it, the occasion was not great. Um, in some ways, it wasn't great. Uh, it, was, it was Grace's home going. She uh, had been battling cancer for three years, and she went home to be with the Lord. Um, and uh, so we, we had the privilege and honor of being down there with them. One of the things that really struck them and they wanted to, he, he wanted to convey is how much he appreciates your love and your support and how when you can come from another country speaking a completely different language and having used to different customs, you can come into a body like this and know that you're loved and know that you're cared for. Many of you sent cards and flowers and uh, uh, Kurt and Julie Gallicky, they they joined us down there. Um, and uh, others of you wanted to come when were unable, but they know that, and they want you to know they love you, and they appreciate you as a family. Um, so I just want to encourage us, as, as people come into our congregation that you don't know, we have several mine students here right now. I won't embarrass them, but you can probably pick them out. Let's make sure that, that we don't miss these visiting angels. God's bringing them into our lives so that we can be blessed and our lives can be more full and, and that we can be a blessing to them. One of the stats that Terry and Trudy Thompson, who lead our international ministry, remind us of on occasion is that 85% of students who come visiting the U.S. from another country never darken the inside of an American home. I would like to break that rule in our congregation. I would love for every student, international or otherwise, to be in our homes. I want to encourage us to make sure that we're reaching out. We are a friendly and a caring church. Let's, let's continue to show that to the students. Um, it, it amazes me, um, even though I, I got to see it with my own eyes, um, but, but they they treated us like family because of the time we spent here. And indeed, we, we are family because of Jesus' blood. His blood flows through the veins of everyone who's expressed faith in him. So let's continue doing the thing that we all want to do and continue to encourage one another to do. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for this family. Thank you for... Jesus, who is the reason we can all come together, for his willingness to, to come down to this earth to lay aside everything, to lay aside the, the, the free exercise of his prerogatives as God, to be humiliated, become a child, a baby, who needed someone to care for his every need, to grow up to experience bullying, to experience rejection, to experience acne, to experience middle school, to experience all of it. And live a perfect life. Raise up a group of people who would follow him and then experience watching him dying. Thank you that his death was not permanent. It was not terminal. But he rose from the dead to give us new life. Thank you that every person in this room and every person at Life Church in Houston, Texas, where Tunde and his girls are worshiping right now, every one of us who put our faith and trust in Jesus is part of your family. Father, I pray that today you would just remind each and every one of us and that you would put it in each and every one of our hearts to look around the room, to watch the door as people come in every Sunday and look for that person who is unfamiliar to us, 
and reach out to them and bring them into our family. May we each see that as our honor and privilege and opportunity. Father, we pray for your grace to be with Tunde as he's lost his wife, his, his partner for life. You have chosen to take her home and you've chosen to leave him and his three little girls here. And we pray that you would continue to surround them with your love, with the people that can show love to them and God for you to speak to their hearts right now. Lord, I know that there are other needs and hurts, concerns in our body right now as well. So I'm going to invite you to just pause for a moment with me. Lift your requests up to God. And let's invite him to intervene. You are mighty. You are powerful. You are good. You are merciful. You never change. Thank you that that, that doesn't mean that you get stale and that you're just the same old tired thing. But you are on the cutting edge of everything that's happening in this world. You've always been a missionary God. You've always been the God that's out leading us. May we follow you. May we worship you with our lives. In Christ's name, amen. Life is made in small decisions. The little choices reveal who we will become in Christ. Think about the very first temptation that Jesus underwent. Satan, in, Satan challenged him to turn stones into bread. Now, think about it. Who was really going to be hurt if he turned a stone into a piece of bread? He'd been fasting for 40 days and 40 nights. He was hungry. What would it have hurt for him to turn a stone into bread? Jesus' first temptation was a very small thing to us not that big a deal why why would it have affected anyone in a negative way why would Jesus so quickly say no I'm not going to do that here's why because in that simple choice that he made Jesus revealed who he trusted he revealed to whom he had aligned himself our small choices reveal to anyone who is paying attention who we are aligned to. See, it boils down to this in life. There are really only two choices. I am either aligned with God or I am aligned with anything else. I'm either aligned with God or I'm aligned with anything else. G.K. Chesterton, I think, hit the nail on the head when he said, when we choose not to believe in God, it's not that we will believe in nothing, we will believe in anything. Because we are wired to worship. A choice against God is a choice for anything else. A choice against God is a choice for anything else. A choice for anything else is a choice against God and his kingdom. There are really only two kingdoms. There is God's kingdom and there is Satan's kingdom. Now you may think to yourself, that sounds rather harsh. Okay, honestly, it sounds rather simplistic. I'm not sure that we can boil things down into that and say that there are really no other options. But think of it this way. If I'm serving myself, if I'm going after sex or money or power or achievement or accolades, I'm placing that thing on the throne in my life, not God. And that is the very 
sin that brought Satan's kingdom into existence. That's the very thing that caused Satan to fall when he wanted anything other, himself, really, on the throne of God. And so, as hard as we may try, or as violently as we, we may insist that I am the master of my fate, I am the captain of my soul, all we're really doing when we choose to go our way and not the kingdom of God's way, all we're really doing is following after the first rebel. And we become card-carrying citizens of the kingdom of Satan. So, in this small, seemingly insignificant choice to not make himself a sandwich, Jesus revealed his allegiance. Notice something else. The second temptation. Second temptation seems to be just a little bit bigger. Satan takes him up on the, the peak of the temple and he says, throw yourself down so that God can protect you and prove that he's true to his word. Kind of a funky thing for him to ask. But then the third temptation, the daddy of them all. Listen to his words. The devil took Jesus to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And he said to him, all these I will give you if you will fall down and worship me. Now, there's a lot that we can observe about these three temptations. But I want to take a, a macro vision of this. And, and I want to just draw out one simple point. That simple point is this. Little choices lead to big ones. Little choices lead to big ones. When somebody blows it in their lives in a huge way, it doesn't happen overnight. It doesn't happen in a vacuum. It's one small choice after another. Because each and every choice reveals to which kingdom we align ourselves. Whether it's the kingdom of God or it's the kingdom of Satan. We establish our allegiance and our behavioral patterns through a series of small choices. Today we begin a study in the book of Judges. In the book of Judges, we're going to see people just like us. People who, who make choices every single day. Some of those choices seem very inconsequential, but they will lead to, to disastrous choices in the future. And each week as we go through each of these chapters and each of the lives of the people that are, we're going to explore through Judges, I would challenge us to think about what are the choices I'm making in my life? What do my choices reveal is my home base? Which kingdom am I aligning with in how I behave and how I think and what I choose? Because it's not the big things. It's the little things, the little choices that I make every single day that will solidify my choices and will solidify and make my life, whether it's aligned with God's or aligned with myself and really Satan's kingdom. God has shown his grace to Israel from the very beginning. He set them apart to be his holy people. The book of Joshua ends with the people of Israel in the promised land. God has promised them that all of the promised land was theirs. Their name was written across every square inch of what used to be called the land of Canaan. And now it is called the promised land. It's the land of promise. It's the place that God was planning to take them. Now, here's how it starts in Joshua chapter 13 before we get to Judges. Now Joshua was old and advanced in years, and the Lord said to him, You are old and advanced in years, and there remains yet very much land to possess. So here's the scene. In his grace, God has gifted Israel all of the land, but they didn't yet possess it. It's like we say, possession is nine-tenths of the law, right? 
It was theirs. But there were still people living there. There were still people they needed to dispossess. They needed to step out in faith and allow God to actually give them the land that he had already given to them. Because they didn't possess the land, they were leaving a lot of God's grace on the table. Because they didn't possess the land, they were leaving a lot of God's grace on the table. Are there things that God wants in your life that you don't yet possess? Is there grace that God wants to give to you that you don't yet possess? Could it be that as we go through this book of Judges, you and I will see ourselves and we will see the steps of faith that we need to take to receive the grace that He's already laid out for us. Imagine when we get to heaven and we walk in and and, and, and as we go through the gates and we're welcomed in and we see maybe off to the the right a table with, with gifts all wrapped and beautiful. And, and we can't take our eyes off of them. We walk in, we, we see these gifts, and we're like, man, I, I like presents. I wonder if those are for me. Anybody here like presents? I love presents. I don't like how my mom wraps presents. My mom, she uses like three rolls of duct tape to close a <laughs> present up. I want to get into it, right? So we all like presents, right? We walk in, and we see those presents, and, and we, 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 we're curious, and so we ask, you know, who are those presents for? They were for you. Really? Well, why didn't you give them to me? Because you didn't step out in faith. You didn't believe I was going to give them to you. You didn't ask. I think that our God is full of grace and of mercy and love. And he wants to pour more of that into our lives. And in the book of Judges, I titled this series, or this, this message, the, the, mes- the title of the message today is Grace Unclaimed. Because what we'll see in the beginning here and throughout the book is, is they end up leaving a lot of grace on the table because they don't believe God. Ephesians tells us that we are saved by grace through faith. Faith is what activates that grace in my life. Grace is something God wants to give to every single one of us all the way throughout our lives. We need to continually preach the gospel to ourselves every day. Understanding the gospel isn't something that happened just at one point and we're done. The gospel is something I need to remember every single day because guess what? Even though I put my faith and trust in Jesus, even though I know I'm forgiven and I'm a child of God, I, I got to tell you, there are days I sin. Well, let me, let me be honest. There's probably not a day that I don't sin. And whenever I sin, what am I doing? I'm choosing not to step out in faith and receive the grace God wants to put into my life. I'm choosing to leave those presents unopened. And I think that that does a dishonor to God. Grace, God's unearned blessing, is available to every single person. Just as it was available to every single tribe of Israel. But as we'll see even in this first chapter, they left a lot of that grace on the table. The only thing holding them back, and the only thing holding us back, is our faith believing what God said is true every step every small decision reveals our allegiance are we people of faith who walk in God's grace or are we people of fear who choose not to trust God and receive his grace do we believe that God offers it to us Do we believe that he can give it to us? Are we willing to put our lives, to put our everything on the line to receive his grace? God's grace is available to anyone who will come to him by faith. If you're here today, 
and you've never put your faith and trust in Jesus, you're here today because God wants to say to you, I have a gift for you. The gift of eternal life. If you'll put your faith and trust in me today, I'll begin life in you like you've never known it before. And if you've already put your faith and trust in Jesus, you're here today because at the beginning of a new school year, the beginning of a new period of of your life, whether it's in retirement or as a grandparent or as a neighbor or as a business person, God is saying, I have some grace I want to pour into your life if you will simply allow me. A little more history before we get into Judges. Before Moses died, God told Moses, I want you to appoint Joshua as the next leader of the nation. Now, I've looked at the book of Joshua and I've always kind of judged Joshua and thought, you know, Joshua, you needed to have a a succession plan. You didn't do your job as a leader to put a leader in place. I was the one who was wrong. God was the one who was supposed to make that decision. God told Moses, pick Joshua. And he had a reason for not picking a leader to succeed Joshua because he wanted the tribe of Judah to be the ones who would be in the lead, to set the standard. He had already talked about Judah and how the, the role that they would play back in Genesis through the, through the mouth of, of uh, Israel or, or Jacob. And, and said that the Messiah was going to come through him, said he was going to take a lead role in the nation, and now it was time. He wanted him to step up to the plate. So here's how it reads in Joshua chapter 1. Turn your Bibles over to Joshua chapter 1. If you um, don't happen to have a Bible, there is a pew Bible, in, uh, <laughs> there's a Bible in the pew in front of you. And if you don't have a Bible, we'd love for you to take this as our gift. It's on page 165, by the way. If you're using one of the Pew Bibles every Sunday, we're going to give you a cheat sheet and tell you the page to turn to, so it'll make it a little easier. Page 165, Joshua 1. After the death of Joshua, the people of Israel inquired of the Lord, Who shall go up first for us against the Canaanite to fight against them? The Lord said, Judah shall go up. Behold, I have given the land into his hand. From the very start of the book of Judges, Israel knew that all the promised land was gifted to him, to them by God himself. The only question remained, how much of the promised land would they occupy? Now think about that. God said it's all yours. The only question was how much of it would they occupy? What was the thing that was going to hold them up? If God says it's yours... What holds it back from you? Believing God. Taking God at his word. Saying, God, I'm going to trust you. I'm going to follow after you. I'm going to do whatever you want me to do. But the book of of, um, Judges pushes Israel even further. It doesn't just ask how much of the land they will occupy, but why don't they occupy it all? So as we go through the book of Judges, look for those reasons. What's holding God's grace back from Samson's life? What's holding God's grace back from Gideon's life? What's holding God's grace back from the people of Israel as they yet again turn away from God into a false God, into sin? What is holding back God's grace? And how does that fit with me? What holds back claiming all that God has given them? Am I leaving grace on the table? Is there something that God wants to pour into my life that I'm not allowing him to do? Now Judah is the first to go and he knows it. Interestingly enough, back in Joshua chapter 19, um, verse 1, there's another tribe named Simeon. Simeon is told that, that, that their allotment of, of, of land is going to be in the middle of Judah's property. So listen to what Judah says here at the beginning. Judah said to Simeon, his brother, 
Come up with me into the territory allotted to me that we may fight against the Canaanites and I likewise will go with you into the territory allotted to you. Now, it would be easy to assume that because Simeon was going to be in the midst of Judah's land, that that's the reason he brought him up. And really, when you think about it, it makes, makes good sense because both Judah and Simeon were blood brothers. Leah was their mom. So for those two reasons, it makes sense that those, those two would go up together. But it makes me wonder, is there something else going on here? Is this a hint at something a little less than stellar? in the character of Judah. See, when God told Judah, um, I had given the land into his hand, that, that's literally the words there, he was showing Judah that the action from the outside. What he was saying is, this is a, a completed thing. I've given it to you. Go take it. I've given it to you. Go receive it. But I, I wonder if Judah was walking in faith. And I wonder if there was something more going on with him inviting Simeon. Here's the thing. The, the conquest began very well. Judah and Simeon defeated an army of 10,000. And they, they defeated um, a guy named Adani Bezik. He was the, the king killer. He, he, we find out in just a second here that, that there were 70 kings and 70 nations that he destroyed. Um, look at what he says in verse 6. Adani Bezek fled, but they pursued him and caught him and cut off his thumbs and his big toes. And Adani Bezek said, 70 kings with their thumbs and their big toes cut off used to pick up scraps under my table as I have done. So God has repaid me. And they brought him to Jerusalem and he died there. I got to say, this, is a, this, this passage has always bugged me. Is, is Israel going to be the new bully on the block? Is Israel going to be humiliating the leaders of the land just like someone like Adani Bezek did? I don't know. But I will say this. Remember when Jacob wrestled with the angel of the Lord all night long? And when he wrestled with the angel of the Lord, finally he was, he was exhausted and the angel had just been toying with him all night long, just wanted to make him fight and make him, make him work for it, make him stand strong. And Jacob says to him, I'm not going to let you go. He grabbed onto him with all the strength in his body and he said, I'm not going to let you go until you tell me your name. And he said, I'm not going to tell you my name. And he said, oh, by the way, and he took his finger and he touched his hip. And it went out of joint. And he walked with a limp the rest of his life. Because the point wasn't, can man ever prevail against God? The point was, will man yield to God? And when man yields to God, God will often bring a limp into our lives to remind us that we need to follow after him and trust him. I wonder if that's not a bit of God's grace showing up for Adani Bezek. Because look at what he says. He doesn't say, you know, we would say this is karma and it's coming back on him. There, there is no such thing as karma, by the way. There is always and only a God who is in control of everything and we do reap what we sow, but it's not a mindless force. It's an actual God. And he says... What I've done to other people, God has repaid me. And I wonder if that wasn't a bit of God's grace because it says they took him back to Jerusalem. It doesn't say they killed him. Took him back to Jerusalem and there he died. I wonder if it was maybe God's grace. Like Rahab, Adani Bezek had likely heard about God and now he had experienced him with his own eyes. I wonder. We don't really have anything in the text that tells us. But could this have been God's grace to this pagan Canaanite king? There's a possibility that it could be indicative of something else. You see, what ends up happening when Israel is supposed to go into the land of, of promise, they're supposed to represent God and, and kick out people and then be a witness to the rest of the people surrounding them so that people see who God's people are and, and who God is and begin to be drawn to him. But instead, what ends up happening 
is the people of Israel become like the Canaanites? And could it be that they, that they didn't do what they were supposed to do and they, they treated him in the way that they shouldn't have treated him, humili humiliating him, because they were becoming like the people of the land? You know, sometimes when people wrong us, we feel like we now have a free shot. We can strike back. But could it be that God wants them to see something different in how we behave, in how we treat them? Could it be that God allowed us to be in the situation we're in so that we can be as conduits of grace? Judges is going to give us a lot to think about. Judah continued his campaign. And victory after victory, moving across this section of the land, they defeated Jerusalem, the hill country, the lowlands, and the Negev, which is um, uh, the desert, um, Hebron, Shishai, Ahiman, and Talmai. And then, then we hear this really strange thing uh, out of nowhere, it's a blast from the past. We hear of a, a name that's familiar to us, a, a name of a man who, who was alive and well during Joshua's time. The, the point here is not that he's trying to lay out in this first chapter a chronological um, retelling of all that happened, but he's contrasting. You've got Judah, who's conquering, and then you have a rising star in Judah named Caleb. And after Caleb, there'll be more about Judah. So he's focusing here on Caleb. Caleb says in verse 12, he who attacks Kiria Sefer and captures it, I will give Aksa, my, my, my daughter, for a wife. Interestingly enough, Caleb, at this time, is 85 years old. 85. Now, when he was 40, he joined 11 other men. They went into the land of promise. And he and Joshua came back, and they... they they told all about all the abundance that was in the land. And they're like, God is truly with us. God is going to watch over us. God is going to enable us to take this land. But the 10 others that were with them, they said, no way. There's no way that we can do this. Numbers 13, 33, it says, And there we saw the Nephilim, the sons of Anak, who, were, who came from the Nephilim. Now, the Nephilim were, were legendary people. They were, they were giants. And we seem to ourselves, listen to this, we seem to ourselves like grasshoppers. And so we seem to them. So here's the point. The Nephilim, the giants, did not make them afraid. The giants did not make them afraid. The giants revealed the fear that they had already been nursing in their hearts because of the simple daily choices they were making in who they would and who they would not trust. And then we see Caleb, 85-year-old Caleb. This is what he said, Behold, the Lord has kept me alive just as he said these 45 years since the time the Lord spoke this word to Moses while Israel walked in the wilderness and now behold I am this day 85 years old I'm still as strong today as I was in the day that Moses sent me my strength now is as my strength was then for war and for going and coming so now give me this mountain the mountain he wanted was the mountain where the giants dwelled give me this mountain of which the Lord had spoken on that day for you heard on that day how the Anakim were there with great fortified cities, it may be that the Lord will be with me and I shall drive them out just as the Lord said. Catch that last phrase. He's not saying, I deserve this. I'm going to do this. I'm going to make it happen. That's what our attitude sometimes is. When we hear God's voice, we say, yes, I'm going to do it. But when we hear God's voice, instead of claiming it in our, in our own strength, he wants us to do exactly what Caleb did. It may be that the Lord will be with me. It's God's will, but I'm going to pursue it. I'm going to give everything that I have to this because I know God has called me. 
and I am going to follow after him with everything that I have. As we continue watching, however, Judah's choices revealed their allegiance. Caleb said, give me that mountain. There's no giant too big. My God is bigger. I will receive whatever grace God wants to pour into my life because I'm going to take it by faith. I'm going to trust him every single step of the way. But we read in verse 18 of Judges 1, Judah also captured Gaza with his territory and Ashkelon with his territory and Ekron, Ekron excuse me, with his territory. Now here we go. And the Lord was with Judah and he took possession of the hill country. The Lord was with Judah and he took possession of the hill country, but he could not drive out the inhabitants of the plain because they had chariots of iron. Is there anything too big for God? Up until this time, the people of Israel had defeated people with chariots of iron. And remember how it all started? Who was chasing Israel down into the Red Sea? With all their chariots, and say chariots of iron. These were probably a different sort of chariot, but there was hundreds, probably thousands of them. And who defeated that enemy? God did. So what did Judah do? Judah did just what Peter did when he was walking on the water. Judah did just what you and I do when we're faced with something that's way bigger than we can handle. We take our eyes off of Jesus and we put it on that obstacle and we sink. And if we're smart, we cry out, Jesus, help me, which is what Peter did. It is not what Judah did. Judah said, uh, no, not going there. They have chariots of iron. We can't handle that. Now, as goes the leader, so goes the people. I want to just scan down through the rest of this first chapter. The verses will show up on the screen, but we're not going to read every word. Verse 21, following Judah's lead. Benjamin did not drive out the Jebusites who lived in the land, so the Jebusites have lived with the people of Benjamin in Jerusalem to this day. Manasseh, verse 27, did not drive out the inhabitants of Beth Sion and its villages, or Tonic and its villages, or the inhabitants of Dor and its villages, or the inhabitants of Iblim and its villages, or the inhabitants of Megiddo, where well, you get the idea. And that verse ends with this, for the Canaanites persisted in dwelling in the land. Now, why weren't they able to do it? Were they not strong enough? Huh. It's not by might, it's not by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord. There's nothing too big for your God. Nothing too big for my God. Verse 29, Ephraim did not drive out the Canaanites. Verse 30, Zebulun did not drive out the inhabitants of Kidron. Verse 31, Asher did not drive out the inhabitants of Akko. So the Asherites lived among the Canaanites, verse 32 says. Thir verse 33, Naphtali did not drive out the inhabitants of Beth Shemesh. And verse 34, it's even worse. The Amorites pressed the people of Dan back into the hill country. Not only did they not dispossess them, but they allowed them to tell them where they would live. You can't be down here on the plains. You're going to be up in the hills. Now that is not the grace that God wants to pour into our lives. He does not want us living defeated lives. They owned all the land. It had been gifted to them by God's grace, but they did not possess the land because they were afraid. What is it in your life that you are allowing to keep you back from? What fear has crept in to an area of your life that God might be putting his finger on right now. You're choosing fear instead of faith. Now, I'm not saying that we, as some in our day and age say, that we command God and, and we can make it happen. I'm saying God is working in each and every one of our lives and he's got something that he wants to do in us. What are we letting fear keep us back from accepting 
of his grace that he wants to pour into our lives? Is there something that he wants to do that we're not allowing him to do? You see, their small choices nurtured that fear in them. And it became the pattern of their life. They acted out of fear, not faith. They saw the world through the eyes of fear. So here's the principle. No one else will ever see you as a grasshopper until you first see yourself as a grasshopper. If you see yourself as someone who is too weak, too uneducated, too unskilled, unable, then you will not prosper in faith. You will walk in fear. Life is made up of the small choices. The small choices reveal our allegiance and every choice is a choice toward Jesus' kingdom or Satan's. I'm going to read the last five verses here of chapter 2. Or first five verses, excuse me. Now the angel of the Lord went up from Gilgal to Bochim and he said, I brought you up from Egypt and brought you into the land that I swore to your fathers. I said... I will never break my covenant with you and you shall make no covenant with the inhabitants of this land and you shall break down their altars but you have not obeyed my voice. They evidently made covenants and they did not break down their altars. And so listen to what he says. What is this you have done? So now I say, I will not drive them out before you but they shall become thorns in your sides and their gods shall be a snare to you. As soon as the angel of the Lord spoke these words to all the people of Israel, the people lifted up their voices and wept, and they called the name of that place Bochim, which means weeping. And they sacrificed there to the Lord. What do you notice is missing in their response? They didn't repent. They didn't acknowledge, God, you're right. We're in the wrong. Forgive us. Heal us. They were sad. And they said, well, we're really sorry, God. Here, have some meat. Is that what we do? When God shows us something that really shouldn't be in our lives, is that the attitude that we have? Do we say, well, I'm, I'm really s- sorry, God. Um, let me go on with my day. If God puts his finger on something this morning, or if God puts his finger on something as we go through this series in Judges, and I want to encourage you to be here every Sunday because I think God has something he wants to say to us as a church and and me and each of us as individuals. Let's have the attitude that I'm going to do whatever God tells me to do. I'm I'm going to stop doing whatever God tells me to stop doing. I'm going to bring this thing to him. I'm going to yield to him because I want to receive the grace that he has for me. And I know I'll receive it by faith. Their choices revealed their allegiance, working in concert to confirm, establish, and determine their lives. And their choices had consequences. That's what the angel of the Lord was saying to them. God promised you this whole thing. You wouldn't take it. So now, you get a promise, but you lose. You lose out on everything God wanted you to have. And here's the hard thing to swallow. Their hearts were already worshiping something. Their hearts were already worshiping someone other than God. When our choices are not choices of faith, we cannot receive God's grace that has already been given to us. When our choices are not choices of faith, we cannot receive God's grace that has already been given to us. And our choices reveal the allegiance that we hold to whichever kingdom. God's kingdom or Satan's kingdom. Tim Keller is an an author and pastor that uh, really challenges my thinking. He was talking in a, in a podcast that I was listening to a couple weeks ago about a, a, a movie just simply titled Max. The movie's about the young Adolf Hitler. 
and his, his interaction with a Jewish artist. And in the movie, um, well, as he described it, I'll just say this, it, it really challenged me. I haven't seen the movie, so I'm not promoting the movie. I don't know what it's like or anything like that. But as I, as I, I scanned the internet, I found some, some uh, critics' comments, and, and I found this quote by the, the director. Um, the director says this, um, Critics of Max worry that any attempt to humanize Hitler detracts from his horrific deeds, but it's far more dangerous to pretend that figures such as Hitler emerged from a vacuum to assume their place in history. Max, aided by Noah Taylor's remarkable performance, does well in creating a frighteningly human Hitler, examining the personal and societal factors that shape him while showing no sympathy for his actions or decisions. Well, the, the, um, the director... Menno Meyes, um, in response to that criticism of humanizing him too much, he said this, Yes, I do want to depict Hitler more like us, but not to make him less monstrous. The movie isn't about Hitler's great crimes. The audience already knows about those. This movie is about his small sins, his emotional cowardice, his relentless self-pity, his envy of others his frustration, the way he collected and nurtured offenses, and his desperate need for recognition. The later Hitler obliges us by representing an uncomplicated picture of evil. We could look at him and say, look at how monstrous he is. I could never do anything like that. But I came to realize as I read his life, nobody wakes up one day and slaughters millions. You make choices one at a time. Every human being could become a Hitler. And it would not happen all at once. It would happen one small choice at a time. It begins with the small choices, and the small choices lead to bigger choices, and each choice reveals whose kingdom I'm aligning myself with. Where's your allegiance? What motivates your choices? We just go through the day and we don't even think about what's motivating our choices. What are we saying, for instance, when we hold a grudge? Somebody wrongs us and we take that offense personally. They meant it personally. Tim Keller described it this way. Somebody has wronged you and you have a deep-seated need for recognition. How dare they humiliate me so? Instead of repenting of your pride and forgiving the person who wronged you, forgetting how much you've been forgiven, you keep the grudge. It's always easier to keep the grudge than to forgive, and so you take the easy way. Isn't that what Satan wanted Jesus to do? Jesus, I know you're here to have a kingdom. I know you're here to rule the world. Let me show you all the kingdoms. I can give you all this without the cross. You don't have to go through that. You can have it all now. You can take the easy way. It is difficult. It is humanly impossible to forgive someone who wrongs us. We need the power of the Holy Spirit. We need to surrender to Him to allow Him to help us yield and then allow Him to work in us and through us. Could it be that that's what Judah did by inviting Simeon to this battle? Take the easy way out and not have to step out in faith himself? So, when we are faced with intimidating obstacles, when we are faced with our chariots of iron, for us it might be a challenging relationship. For us, it might be a moral dilemma that we're faced because of our faith at work. Or whatever the intimidating obstacle, our automatic choice reveals the allegiance we normally go to and gives us an opportunity to say no. I will align with Jesus. I will 
choose faith. And as we choose faith, we will unleash God's grace in our lives. And that's what he wants. Choose faith. Because faith unlocks God's grace in your life. As a pastor, a lot of times, I'll share examples of, of positive things, and I hesitate to share this example. It's, it's not a positive thing. But I can tell you that we're all human, and we all do things that we wish we hadn't. And when we do, what we're saying is, my allegiance is to the kingdom of Satan. I would say to myself, but really, I'm just following the first rebel. This is uh, something I wrote in my journal not long ago. Maybe you can relate. God, most of what I give is to gain something for myself or prove something to myself or make myself look good. And I not only hurt you, but I harm Connie and others. I don't want to be this way but I don't know how to make this change real. Make me a new man in Christ. Make, make me who you intend for me to be as your son. Crack open the shell, the facade of godliness, and give me the real thing. Even now the thoughts of how, other, how well others will think of me slithers into my mind, attempting to settle in my heart. God, I see it. I feel it. Oh God, help me. I want it. That's why I'm reading it. Replace my selfish, idolatrous, and godless thoughts, intents of my heart, and worldview with your mind for me. I long for transformation into Jesus' image. I can't do it. I'm hopeless because I'm helpless to affect the change I need. And if what I think I need is not what I really need, oh God, you alone know me to my depths. Do what you desire and make your desires mine. I believe that's the attitude God wants us to have at First Baptist Church. We've been called by God to be a force for God's grace in golden and beyond by being disciples of Jesus, and it begins by us being transparent and real, by not leaving any grace on the table, but it challenges us to step out in faith. Choose faith in every decision you make this week because faith unlocks God's grace in your life. God, I long to walk in all the favor that you have for me. And I get in my own way. And I get in your way. And I'm ashamed. But I don't have to live in that shame. I can confess it to you and walk in grace. Father, I pray that you would help each and every one of us to be grace bearers, to be grace livers, to be grace responders. May we choose grace and walk in faith this week. In Jesus' name.